Welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure that uh, we have all gathered uh, to have this uh, first of a kind webinar uh, for all the keratoprosthesis aficionados um, in the galaxy. I hear that Dimitri Asar has managed to get us uh, zoomed into outer space. So um, we have visitors from uh, several other galaxies, including uh, the Milky Way. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dimitri, for that. Uh, and we will go ahead and start. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to say a, a, a few words, and certainly the theme of today's meeting is going to be an interview with Dr. Klaus Dolman that will be conducted by Dr. Jose de la Cruz, who has really taken on the human's job of organizing this uh, webinar with uh, Dr. Jean-Marie Perel and with all the technical help of uh, Alex uh, Gonzalez. And um, I'd like to, uh, we're gonna hear about uh, Dr. Dolman uh, in just a minute, but I'd like to say that uh, Jean-Marie Perel, uh, who uh, was going to say a few words today, uh, but he's having some internet uh, issues, uh, is, is not able to, but Jean-Marie um, is uh, truly a person similar to uh, Klaus Dolman, who uh, knows that oh. I ideas are easy to come by, but it's all the work behind them that makes them uh, quite special. And Jean-Marie is one of these uh, individuals who just uh, puts an enormous amount of work uh, in uh, making things happen. So thank you, uh, Jean-Marie, uh, for doing that. Um, I'd like to uh, also share with you a, a video that uh, Dr. Elena Barraker, um, uh, a friend, colleague, um, and uh, also a curative prosthesis aficionado, like all of us, uh, would like to say a few words. Uh, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and share that screen so we can hear her. <clears throat> Hello, Claes. I'm so sorry I cannot be with you on such a special date. I have great memories of my three years at Mass Engineer back in 1984. And one special yeah. funny memory is when you were waiting for your wife to pick you up outside Mass Engineer, you had the flu, you fell, opened your forehead, and I was the first year resident on call and you elected for me to suture your forehead and said, oh, a barraquer suit my forehead. I won't have any astigmatism. Love you and wish I was there. Thank you, uh, Elena, for doing that. Thank um, you, Elena. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. I have a few slides uh, to embarrass Klaus, as I always uh, like to do. Uh, and so let me, so Klaus has been a uh, true uh, uh, mentor and a friend, I would say, to Hi. all of us. And um, uh, Klaus, thank you so much. And let me see if I can do this as a, uh, good. Uh, so uh, it, um, I'm going to, just come uh, back here a second. Better, uh, better without. Okay. Got uh, kicked out. Uh, I, I, fe I felt I was zooming to a different galaxy. Thank <laughs> you. Bed, Dimitri was taking us to different galaxies. Oh, yeah. Too much Milky Way. Yeah. So, so anyways, I, uh, I just wanted to share a few uh, slides with you, but since we are running a little late, um, uh, the slides basically uh, extol uh, the uh, great uh, mentor and friend that Klaus has been to all of us. And uh, uh, I think uh, the science has been extremely, extremely important, but the human empathy that Klaus has always shared with us is probably, uh, to me, the biggest asset uh, that uh, Klaus, uh, you have been able to give to all of us. And, uh, and certainly, I, I speak not only from everyone who's on this webinar, but from uh, 
thousands of others that you've touched along the way. Uh, thank you so much for everything you've done for all of us. And don't give up. Keep doing more. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Eddie. <laughs> thank you, Eddie. I feel extremely honored, extremely honored over this source-sided uh, welcoming screen here. So thank you so much. Thank Great. you very much. I think that now we have Jose de la Cruz who's going to uh, take it over. All right, all, you know, welcome everybody. This is a, 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 we're very happy to have you all in this great event. Uh, our panelists, our guests, uh, panelists, as well as all the audience. Um, we're looking forward to a, a great conversation with our dear friend and colleague and mentor, Dr. Klaus Dolman. Uh, Klaus, can you hear me right? Yes, I can hear you. All right. <clears throat> From now on, we're going to just, you and I are going to share the screen. We're going to have the panelists uh, listen in and have some questions afterwards. Uh, but as we spoke before, uh, Klaus, you know, we, we've been all sort of your, your students and, uh, and, 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 you know, you've been our mentor for many years. And as we, we had our access to, to such great knowledge, we also want to make sure that the rest of the, uh, the world internationally, you know, understands and knows, you know, your background, uh, all the, uh, all of you done. And this is a great uh, time to share that with all our uh, rest of the colleagues. So Klaus, just to start out, um, and as we spoke in the past, it, I think the audience and all of us would like to hear uh, from the beginnings of Klaus Dolmans, your years uh, as a younger student in Sweden and uh, how this sort of evolved into the field of ophthalmology, because as, as you will tell us, not everything was ophthalmology in the start of your life. Please go <laughs> ahead, Klaus. Well, <clears throat> thank you. I, again, I'm extremely honored by uh, this uh, greetings, and uh, uh, I can give you some comments on the background of what you're asking me. And uh, yes, I was born and almost 99 years ago and uh, into a middle class academic family in uh, Lund, Sweden, and uh, <clears throat> went to school there. Not always successful, but uh, I had a somewhat sickly childhood. I, uh, I was autoimmune and uh, had stretches of fever and things like that. I didn't function really that well, but I perked up <clears throat> in uh, my teens and uh, graduated uh, without difficulty uh, as a bac baccalaureate in, from Lund. And uh, I went to medical school in Lund. And then um, I went up to Professor Sven Larsson, who was the head of ophthalmology in Lund, and asked him if I could start as an apprentice there. And uh, no, there were no formal residences at the time. And he said yes, and I started. And there were only four positions, uh, paid positions, uh, at, the, at the hospital, the like eye clinic. Uh, and uh, one had to wait in turns and long stretches without any salary and so on. And during one of those stretches, I uh, went to Baltimore to Friedewald, which turned out to be almost two years, and uh, did some history chemistry with him. I had <clears throat> an interest in biochemistry from medical school, and I was a sort of a a little flunky there, assistant teacher. And um, so I was have drawn to, for reasons I cannot explain, I, I sulfated uh, uh, polysacc mucopolysaccharides, proteoglycans, and uh, I continued that with Frida Wall. Uh, not all that successfully. We. Uh, identified the, some histochemical uh, pitfalls and so on. So that was of some interest, but it didn't carry ophthalmology forwards exactly. And then <clears throat> back to Sweden and uh, further training. I had a PhD in biochemistry and uh, I was uh, 
and a docent, uh, which is a sort of an assistant professor at the clinic. And uh, I got a, a recruitment offer from, uh, from Harvard. And uh, the people who were really behind this were really Skippens and Ballard, although the chief, uh, Dunphy, was the one who, in the long run, did the most for me. And uh, I had no intention of emigrate for good at all. I had a wonderful position in Lund, uh, but I had some ambition to maybe become a chairman once sometime and three years in Boston, which they wanted. Uh, I thought that that might be uh, an added uh, uh, twist to my my aspirations. <clears throat> so uh, I said yes, and they say you can travel wherever you want in the world and learn more about cornea uh, for six months and then be in Boston for three years. And that was the arrangement. Dr. Dorman, I, I ask you, because we ought to give some, some content right to the, to the, at that time, as you mentioned, when you say cornea, in, in this period of time, the, the cornea service did not exist. Am I correct? And uh, so this was evolving so, <clears throat> more into the insight of how going into an environment which basically you have to develop a cornea service or field itself. Uh, and could you please comment on that? Well, uh, <clears throat> it is true that there was no formal cornea service anywhere in the world. And, uh, <clears throat> and when I came to Boston, to the INEAR, Massachusetts INEAR Infirmary and Harvard, uh, <clears throat> it, it seemed like a big vacuum there. There were some very senior, very skilled and very nice clinicians interested in cornea. Uh, and they had an occasion, occasional apprentice and so on, but that was all. Uh, and there were Gunderson and Sullivan and Lay, particularly, wonderful people and uh, skilled clinicians. Uh, but <clears throat> there was uh, not Harvard Academia exactly, and, uh, and there, was, there was something missing. And, and, uh, but when I came, <clears throat> I was to do, quote, do corner and uh, unquote, but uh, Skeppens had a change of heart. He wanted me to do retina with him. Uh, Balash wanted me to do biochemistry with him. And the, in the, but uh, Dunphy was my savior. And I got a little uh, 10 by 10 room at the hospital and I had a lab at the, what was called the retina foundation at the time. But that was enough to recruit from. And I was extremely lucky. Uh, fellows, fellow applicants came flocking and uh, the best and the brightest. And uh, we see some here. And, <clears throat> and um, so uh, it was easy. And I could recruit uh, half a dozen PhDs and uh, in age, was just building up and they didn't have anybody to give the money from. So you sent in a requisition and you got the money the next day, no questions asked. <laughs> uh, so these were idyllic circumstances. And <clears throat> when I had uh, worked on with this and seen what I had, uh, and I was offered a chair in the meantime at, in Sweden, and I say, I want a little more of this in Boston. So it's all basically, it, it was more a, a very broad approach to ophthalmology in general when you arrived. And this is something that, that you recognize as, as being a niche, you would say? Uh, I would say with one exception, and, uh, which I emulated a lot. And that was Skepens. Skepens was a formidable individual in terms of drive, intelligence, and uh, foresight. And he came here from Belgium after the war, and he set up a, a really a retina service for retina detachment surgery, and was extremely successful. It was much more clinical than I had in mind, and less, uh, less lab and, and so on, but still it was a model. 
and uh, I try to emulate that to a degree, and uh, and that and that's helped a lot. And then would you say at the beginning it was it was, it was a broad approach on cornea? Or you each one that was in the cornea service at Mass Pioneer at that time had a particular niche at that time. No, there was no cornea service. So when, when you started it, I'm sorry. I started, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Jim Aquavella was the first outsider who came knocking on the door and asked to be a fellow. And I asked him, what is a fellow? And, uh, <laughs> and that was, we arranged that. And then uh, people came streaming in. These were very happy days. So Klaus, you know, as, as you give us sort of a, a brief overview right at the beginning, you know, they want to sort of give some, some background too. That, and, and I guess your father was an ENT doctor and then as I was sort of a, a going away from what, uh, what you initially were thinking of going, now went to ophthalmology. But also, uh, as you now enter the Savage Cornea Service, as some people might know, you basically became, you know, you went up through the uh, ranks and so on, and became chairman of the department. Uh, could you give us an insight on, the, on that, that change from the establishing a cornea service and eventually running a, <clears throat> and eventually running a whole department? Uh, how, did, how was that transition to you in regards to your clinical career versus the administrative career? Well, uh, <clears throat> I worked on, and when the three years were up, as I said, I want to stay a little longer and get a little more out of this. I had the world that I could work with. And we got patients from all over. We had fellows, the brightest, and uh, we had a core backbone of PhDs in the lab at uh, the Retina Foundation. And everything was very rosy. And uh, then after having worked for a decade there, uh, the Massachusetts Iron Infirmary between you and me was a bit an unruly place. And uh, there was a little bit like a, a, a Central American uh, 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 Banana Republic and people lived for the revolution and the, the dean kicked out Kogan and the, the managers kicked out the, manage, the director and then the dean kicked out the, or the, the next chief and, and so on. And finally, somebody came and pointed at me. Uh, me? You must be kidding. Uh, so I should be the next chief. And so they placed me behind a, a desk there and uh, I did the best I could. But I didn't have much of a clue what to do, but I had good help from the senior people there, such as uh, Gurgudas and other people helped me to build the department. And uh, we were really actually, uh, in the end, quite uh, successful. You would say you had 15 years of a run of a chairman. You must have some type of success, right, Klaus? They didn't keep you 15 years for nothing. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad that I took it on. It was stressful at the time, uh, sometimes at least, but it was uh, enjoyable and, uh, and uh, meaningful. And uh, we could really build up a, a Harvard-looking uh, eye department but, so that had a strong academic base as well. So as, as you did that, I mean, you, you were also in, now in a, in a different uh, role, right? And, you know, how did it change you when you practice ophthalmology? How did you, you know, what was your approach in recruiting talent to, to this program? Uh, how was that approach and how that how that, that change your perspective in any way? Well, for us, uh, it was the obvious meritocracy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the cosmopolitan international basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, wherever we could get a, a, uh, a talent, we uh, were very eager as we were orphans. And sometimes I was successful, but sometimes we were not successful. And uh, people came and looked and, and uh, this is too unruly a place and I better say where I am. So uh, uh, that happened also, but by and large, we 
with the help of everybody else, there I, we built a a uh, a good department, and there were people who were worried about their practices and that we would take too much of the surgery or this and that. But by and large, virtually everybody was my my personal friend. So we there was not there were one or two who. I wish I'd been not been there, but <laughs> such is the situation in all departments. So now, Klaus, you know, going through the different uh, roles that you have, of course, you know, during your initial uh, uh, introduction to cornea, establishing a cornea service, being a chairman, you know, and developing as we go into more detail down the line in regards to curative prosthesis, how do um, how do you see what's the direction of cornea training and education in general, in your perspective, having gone through all these pro all these different stages that uh, not many people have been the opportunity to do? How do you see the direction, in, in your point of view, of cornea training or education in general ophthalmology? Well, that's a deep question, but I would think that it's essentially more of the same. Uh, we started this formal corneal service for not only clinical uh, care, but also teaching of uh, residents and fellows and uh, as deep a research as we could mobilize. And that has been emulated by about 60 departments in this country. And uh, that's the standard now. And uh, undoubtedly, it would be more, more and more sub-specialized as time goes on. And uh, one has to focus. Uh, I didn't always do that, but uh, try to, aside from being a, a decent cornea clinician and teacher, but also zero in on one, one topic that where you can make a difference in the long run and then stick to it. Yeah. The, the perseverance aspect is so important. You know, you've remained in, in, in the same institution all your career, basically. And then would you advise the same, as you mentioned now, would that you think is like a key to focusing and developing long-term uh, 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 components of interest? Uh, yeah. or would you suggest to, you know, have different experiences in different departments? I mean, you have your experience, of course, in one place. Um, in your advice to all the people that are listening to now, would you advise, to, as you mentioned, you know, stay in one institution, develop a, 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 a long-term plan, or is it better to have different exposures of different uh, departments and so on? Well, it, it, is, it is different now than it was when, when I arrived uh, 60 years ago. Uh, at that time, the best and the brightest rushed out into clinical practice. Uh, and uh, it was difficult to stimulate any academic interest. Now, it, this has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. So now people realize that uh, uh, often a satisfying career and fun work and so on goes at least in part through academia. Uh, yeah. So it's easier now, but it's more difficult to get money for uh, get grants and so on, but that's, that's the way it is. So Klaus, you know, that we sort of giving, I mean, there's much more, of course, we don't have that much time. There's much more in, into your initial career that uh, has been written and we all are shared and we're interested in, but now going into perhaps uh, and more in detail as in the beginning of your interest into curative prosthesis, could you give us an insight in how all this started? What was the initial spark to go into the field of artificial corneas? Well, that that was more a, a byproduct, not as a really a serious interest in the beginning, in the 1960s. Uh, our interest in the lab, uh, we were phasing out the biochemistry, the uh, proteoglycans, and they became more oriented into uh, fluid physiology, particularly edema. <clears throat> but, um, uh, and also collagenases, as you know, Harvest Lansky and, and the group, and uh, also the antivirals. So we touched on that because of 
we try to help uh, Herb Kaufman uh, a bit with that and the Debbie Langston. Uh, but uh, then <clears throat> I saw uh, some of the efforts that people had uh, elsewhere. And that was, uh, Elena listened to this, it's very much Spain. It was Cardona and uh, Elena's father and uh, Castroviel. And uh, they did interesting work. And Stone did interesting work in Boston on a elementary character prosthesis. And then <clears throat> uh, it was actually in the 1940s that industry uh, produced uh, transparent mesometacrylate, and that is still forming the optical base for most character prosthesis. And, um, and then a lot of bright ophthalmologists uh, rushed to the scene and uh, created devices, but there was something missing, and that was perseverance. And uh, they did a couple of patients, and then a lot of complications. It started with the worst cases, of course, and uh, they got uh, infected, uh, this, uh, this, or that, autoimmune cases. And uh, they got this discouraged and left. It was only, uh, I would say, Cardona and uh, DeVoe <clears throat> and um, to a degree uh, other people, but also the Alpha Core people who were hanging in there for a while. Uh, Cardona, he was, he was very good at that. And uh, and then uh, I wish uh, that Elena's father were, were here, uh, and he was interested for a while, but many people uh, couldn't at the time uh, devote enough time uh, for this. So uh, I tried. Uh, I thought I would try a little bit, and to my surprise, I saw a couple of them. Most of them failed, but a second, couple of them did really spectacularly well. So I thought if you just stick it a little bit longer, uh, another decade or two, maybe something can be developed. So uh, I did that in uh, 35 cases or something like that, hopeless cases. Uh, and then I, they made me chief and then research out of question. It was, I was paid $8,000 for being a chief and uh, I, everybody was yelling at me from all sides. So I, I didn't have the time for, for, uh, uh, for any, uh, any research. But when I retired, uh, Fred Kobiak, my successor, uh, said you can stay on. And I did that. And then uh, uh, John Miller. Uh, and uh, I took it up again around 1989. I had to stay a little longer, actually, because of successful difficulties. So, uh, but I was that for 15 years. Uh, that was a big black hole, research-wise. So but then I took it up to 89. Yeah. So, Klaus, then, you know, during these early periods where you had, you know, sort of limited success or some failures, what insights of encouragement uh, do you have at that time to energize or continue developing the, uh, the device? And at what point did during your caper development, you, did you have a, did you know you had a good product for visualization? At what point was it you said, this is it, we need to really follow it? Because you had, as you know, we had some process of failures, as you mentioned, and you need that perseverance. But at what point would you say was the point that really made you believe in this device and move forward? Well, I think I could say that the tipping point might have been in the early 90s or something like that. I saw some of our cases were so spectacularly good. So I thought maybe a little more push and a little more perseverance a little bit more of this or that uh, could lead it to uh, a better uh, general outcome. And there, were, there was one thing that was very important. I felt that, yes, the, the design 
and the materials which other people had done with such uh, interests. And uh, we have talked about Cardona and, and the Bancaire and, uh, and, uh, and the Ayatha Corps and the, the, this and that. That was design and materials. And they, those factors are still important. But there was the biological aspects, the biological status of the tissue around the keratoprosthesis that really, and, and beyond into the eye, glaucoma, that was really the key. So we oriented ourselves much more towards the biolog biological problems, inflammation, glaucoma, nutrition, uh, enzymology, uh, evaporation, and, and such factors, and long-term uh, prophylactic with antibiotics and so on. And that was highly successful, really, in retrospect. And, uh, but it took time. And uh, that has led us to our present uh, work. Uh, <clears throat> I don't work on character prosthesis any longer. I work on glaucoma, on secondary glaucoma, after corneal surgery, after corneal trauma, after eye surgery in general. And we have been actually quite successful thanks to our lab people, Eleftherius Pascalis, Steve Drew, and other postdocs, and other fellows, and, uh, and also the, the people we've had here, such as Kathy Colby, and Ken Kenyon from the past, and, uh, and, and so on, Roger Pineda, Joe uh, Chilino, and then, of course, uh, in the lab, also Reza Dana's huge lab, and the Vavas uh, retina lab, all those, this was a team product. And the more biology that could, we could squeeze out of, of everything that we had around us and ourselves, uh, the better it seemed to be. And we now have, in the, in the animals at least, we can do away with secondary glaucoma virtually 100%. So we, if we give tna alpha inhibitors, uh, the MABs, like infliximab and adlimumab, uh, we can virtually 100% prevent subsequent damage to the retinal ganglion cells and secondary glaucoma. So now uh, Joe Chulino is uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, transfer that into a clinical study. And uh, I would think that that would be hopefully successful. But then we haven't given up uh, the keratoprosthesis line. I mean, Jim Chodor has developed uh, two new uh, models, and uh, Pineda and then Elifelius Pascalis working on a flexible uh, device and so on. So that is a broad uh, approach. So then you, from, from what we hear from you and from what we've seen, it's been this shift from a design to more the, the what's happening around it. And, uh, and as you mentioned, you're not, you're, not, you're not doing glaucoma, glaucoma, you're doing glaucoma as a response to, to the, the, the device implantation, right? That's what you're referring to, that you're doing yes. the, the attacking the glaucoma from the, in, in the patient with keratoprosthesis. So one glaucoma, of the- Glaucoma is the worst. Uh, complication yeah. that uh, characteristics and other surgery yeah. uh, can have, in my opinion. So having developed the Boston Capro and knowing the struggles of, of, uh, of the process for decades, uh, how do you compare entrepreneurship today with lots of available funding, technology mm -hmm. opportunities for the 40 or 50 year compared to 40, 50 years ago? when craftsmanship was, uh, was a must to have your ideas in practice. How do you compare that? I mean, is it clearly harder than that, at that, in that time than it is now? Well, I have uh, <clears throat> ignored the money aspects uh, in an almost criminal way, but, and we, we didn't think about that particularly, but then we uh, developed this a little bit and there was an outside interest and then we thought that we should set a little price 
on the devices so uh, that we can get some research money. So we brought in uh, about uh, 40 million, I think some, something like that. And we have been living on that ever since. We didn't keep it for ourselves. We had never had more than our standard academic salaries, uh, but uh, we could pay for the, for the research. And uh, that paid off handsomely. So we had, I'd never he had a research NIH grant on keratoprothesis. Uh, so Klaus, then, you know, it, this is, I mean, obviously it's it had great success and it continues to evolve. Uh, what would you say to now the, 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 the graduates? Uh, how would you inspire them in going to not just in the field of cornea, pursuing as you persevered yourself in keratoprothesis and, you know, artificial corneas, uh, what would you say to them to inspire them for continuing doing transformative for innovative research? How would you inspire them to go in this direction? Well, well I, I, what I think, uh, which I have expressed also in various situations, uh, I think it is, you, you have to learn the basics, of course, in first in ophthalmology, general ophthalmology, uh, enough, and then cornea, enough. But then pick one clinically important aspect where you think that you can make a difference in the long run, and then stick with it. Focusing for not only for months and years, but for decades on one thing, one habit, or you, where you get among the best in the, in the world uh, can be so satis satisfying. And that focusing is, is not so easy financially and otherwise. But forget about brilliance. You don't have to be brilliant. But as long as you stick to uh, what you started with, and I haven't always followed that, but uh, I think that is the, the key. And one can have a very fun career that way. That is, that is great advice, Klaus. I, you, you had asked, and then, we, I'm sorry, I forgot in the beginning, but you wanted to give us an update on uh, things that are happening in regards to uh, what you're doing in Capro right now. Would you want to have take some time to give us an update on that? <coughs> well, I, <clears throat> I think the, the outlook for character procedures as a principle, in one form or another, of course, what we have now is, it's only a transitional step, and there will be more and more development, better and better products, and, and so on. Uh, but I think it's a principle. I think it, it will have has a great future. And the reason I'm saying that is that uh, <clears throat> the, even what we have now, which is uh, not well developed, but what we have now is getting better in the long run in, when it comes to outcome uh, than the standard PK. And uh, the person who started to, to really compare was Asian Akpe and also Joma and uh, also a Japanese fellow by the name of Ono. And it seems that <clears throat> if you fail with one, one standard corneal transplant, uh, and you compare PK versus Boston character prosthesis, uh, the outcome is about the same for the first two years. Then it starts to diverge, and the K-Pro is much better after five to eight years. Much better vision, much better retention. And uh, even in, in spite of the fact that the K-Pro cases are usually worse. So, and that has been also translated into not only you doing the grass failures, but using it as primary uh, 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 procedure. Kathy Colby has been on the forefront, Aquavella, and Ethan Akpak, and uh, Mona Dogger, and, uh, and in Chicago, your institution has been on the forefront. Uh, the uh, uh, it, it will do better in the long run, and then the fact that we are 
realizing the far uh, reaching consequences of what we do up front, all the TNF alpha that is upregulated within minutes and diffusing to the rest of the eye, causing havoc in the retina. That was unknown. And then we, we can block that. Uh, it's a different scene. And there are other things also. What we need also beyond the glaucoma, which I think will be solved within the next couple of decades, uh, the, the infection uh, threat, which is much, much better now uh, than it was before when I started. But uh, the biointegration is a difficult issue between tissue and PMMA and titanium. Uh, but will probably could probably be solved by clever chemists and so on, uh, and there are other aspects as well. But inflammation is such an issue, so that if we can suppress that with the with the MABs, with the biologics, I think we are far better off than uh, than before. Well, that's that's great insight, Klaus. Um, and I wanted to have if you could comment also, as you know, there's there's you know more emerging devices, right, that that are coming up uh, with different types of, um, of, of of methods, right? Intrastromal devices, devices of different uh, biomaterials. Uh, and I think this is a very exciting time for the field of artificial cornea or cornea prosthesis. Uh, how do you see that you know different devices that are available? How do you see? them and the success or, or perhaps their, their, their downfalls and, uh, and long-term retention and success and ritual rehabilitation. Do you, want, you mind commenting on that? Yeah, it is it's hard to predict because it takes years for uh, the results to emerge from any, any little change. But I think it is great that uh, there are so many uh, people now who are interested and are developing their own variant or uh, marked uh, change. And uh, sooner or later, it will be gradually become a better and better product. I think uh, uh, Keraclear is interesting and other devices interesting. And uh, the Alpha Core should have uh, uh, continued to develop and, uh, and so on. So I think the, the outlook for the future and with all the institutions taking up the, the line uh, is bound to get better and better and be a dominant force in the rehabilitation of severe corneal disease, particularly in the developing world where uh, presumably 90% of the severe cases uh, exist and try to make out a living. Well, that's, that's great advice, uh, Klaus. I, I think, you know, we've been, you know, there's so much more, right, to, 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 to learn from you and so on because of time constraints, we would love to continue talking. But what I'd like to do now um, is have our, our, our guest panelists, maybe you can start with Dr. Kathy Colby. And Kathy, could you, uh, could you uh, go into the audio in the, in the video? And then Kathy, uh, if you could, you know, you can feel free to ask, you know, any questions that or add to the, to the conversation. And they'll go the same in with uh, Dimitri and then Ken and Eddie and Jean Marie as we go on. But Kathy, are you there? I'm here. Can you see and hear me? Hi, Kathy. There you Hi. are. Okay. How are you? Good, good old friend. Nice to see you. That's All good. right, let me just say that Kathy Colby has been one of the pioneers in the field, not only with the numbers of character persistence that she has done, but also with the ideas, new developments, and so on. So she is one of the leaders. Let's hear from you, Kathy. Klaus, it's great to see you. And I know we're, we're close to the top of the hour. So I, I just wanna uh, give my personal comments. I think about the many lessons I learned from you almost daily as I run my own department. And I think the lessons that are most important to me, uh, you already mentioned, which are really to make the future a better place by 
focusing on mentees, whether that's students, residents, fellows, young faculty, and to pick a question and stick with it despite the inevitable difficulties that occur. So of all the lessons I've learned from you, my friend, um, those are the two that I carry with me every day and know that um, you are one of the people who I think about quite often and there are on the call um, some, some of my uh, students and fellows and uh, they will tell you that those are, I repeat often the uh, very wise comments that you shared with me over the <laughs> five years we had together. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Ken Kenyon, would you like to uh, show yourself in the video? Always happy to expose myself to um, the, Don't do my, my, my cornea brethren, Claus uh, Gaudet. I hope you can uh, see me as I can uh, you. Um, my um, Sort of intellectually driven questions uh, have already been uh, subsumed in your erudite uh, uh, discussions, so I'll uh, truncate uh, um, my piece to uh, my my personal uh, recollection, reminiscence, and uh, and thanks. But uh, I, I suppose my uh, perspective being you know relatively uh, historical uh, as well is one of uh, uh, be, being in the uh, right place at the wrong time vis-a-vis uh, -vis the keratoprosthesis and also the right place at the right time vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, your uh, uh, relentless uh, pursuit uh, of, uh, of trying to uh, support my academic career only second to uh, uh, that of, of um, your Swedish steel heads uh, focus uh, uh, on the, uh, the K-Pro. Um, so to go back to uh, 1976, uh, when I was uh, fortunate to, to join the uh, um, Cornea uh, Corps de Ballet, um, it was not a, a glorious time for, uh, for K-Pro in, indeed. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the notion that you, you were able, uh, and even at that point, being uh, 10 years uh, into it, your first uh, publications uh, being in the early 60s, of course, first in French. Uh, and I might uh, uh, recommend to the um, uh, audience uh, th this extraordinary reminiscence uh, um, by, by your own hand entitled The Boston Keratoprosthesis, the first 50 years, some reminiscences uh, uh, by yourself, uh, perhaps those uh, uh, reprints are available uh, still uh, on request. It, it uh, certainly deserves wider circulation, if not uh, publication. Uh, but uh, you know, looking at um, these early results, as you willingly uh, uh, share, not only from successes as failures, uh, from uh, you know the Cardona prosthesis, this the uh, the in in interminable uh, uh, Falcinelli prosthesis, the the early. Uh, uh, Wazowski uh, prosthesis. You know, the, these things uh, were not uh, of, of, of beauty, and thus uh, in, in my fellowship uh, uh, interval, it was um, more a matter of seeing uh, uh, extrusions and infections and retroprosthetic membranes uh, and more K pros uh, came out than went in. Uh, and, and, but yeah, that, that, that's how one uh, uh, learns. So the, the, the notion uh, and I think Kathy has already expressed this as, as well. Uh, focus is what it's all about. So, you know, your ability to maintain uh, uh, focus for those uh, now these uh, more than 50 years uh, is, is a, uh, uh, the, the primary driving force and example for us all. Um, and then finally, being in the uh, uh, right place at the right time vis-a-vis uh, -vis my own uh, uh, launch, uh, and um, I, I, I guess at some point I probably got uh, um, uh, a bit uh, lost in the in the in the academic uh, Milky Way to, to uh, quote Eddie's opening uh, comment. Uh, but uh, no, I, I was all very much uh, 
uh, assured that I would uh, be for, forever back at, um, at, at Wilmer um, until uh, in uh, the fall of 1978, uh, when the f you'd come to visit and give a, uh, a named uh, lecture. And then uh, uh, out, of, out of the blue uh, comes a phone call and the uh, inimitable CHG <clears throat> uh, third clearing uh, and, and the offer to uh, uh, of totally unanticipated uh, return uh, to uh, d direct your cornea service uh, uh, as a successor to uh, our, our own uh, and already named uh, mentor, De Deborah Langston. What did this do for me? It, it gave me uh, my uh, 15 years of, uh, uh, of academic uh, glory and in particular, um, the the exposure to uh, just among the, the likes of uh, th those on the panel today, uh, Eduardo Alfonso, Kathy Colby, Dimitri Azar, um, you know that that generation uh, of uh, uh, that that I was able to have exposure to, and um, and off off they've uh, all gone, uh, and so I I uh, thank you for allowing me to. Uh, uh, attain my um, uh, optimum uh, uh, orbit. Thank you, Eddie. Um, and and uh, to this uh, day, uh, the ability to uh, um, say that I was I was there when. So um, seventy six, uh, the, the worst of times, the best of times. But I thank you for all those good times then and now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know. <clears throat> Uh, Ken was for a decade or more uh, the director of the Cornea Service. And all the directors did extremely well in academia. Uh, Debbie Langston, Ken, uh, Mike Wagner, Roger Steiner, Dimitri Azar, Riza Dana. Uh, I may have forgotten one or two, but. Uh, that was, uh, in retrospect, the uh, past to sorghum. Thank you very much, Ken. Now let's, let's Dimitri, would you want to turn on your, your unmute yourself and uh, give us some, uh, some comments? Certainly. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be with you, Klaus, again. It's been a long time. You've always been a mentor, a friend, a role model, and truly an inspiration. Uh, you have uh, mentored all of us uh, during your, uh, at least for me, during your chairmanship. And I think during my residency, uh, you, that's when I was your first retirement and I attended your first retirement party, one of many, many. <laughs> uh, I remember those uh, days, which you called turbulent. They were good oh. for us. Uh, cheers again. And uh, later, of course, many Dolman dinners, and when I became a cornea service director, I benefited, I should say, by osmosis from uh, all your uh, uh, wisdom and, and mentorship. Well, I didn't gain the wisdom you had. I still uh, consider myself a rebel. I don't believe in focus. Uh, but perseverance, yes. Uh, I, I know I truly copied your concept of sub-specialization. I remember going to Chicago and it was a revolution. And now the department is benefiting from this. Similarly, when I moved afterwards to the dean's office and later to Google and now at 2020. So, uh, but I think everybody has mentioned your influence on the science, on the development of the keratoprosthesis and, uh, and your uh, uh, dogged uh, hard work to try to answer questions uh, and look at the biology of devices, which by the way, I'm also copying in this new company. I think one thing we need to emphasize, and I can tell many stories, but first and foremost, we have seen you exemplifying caring as a caring physician, caring educator, caring researcher, and caring uh, you know, with its uh, two pillars, the receptivity and responsibility. Uh, receptivity, as a receptive physician, you listened to all your patients, K-Pro patients, to so their complaints. You were uh, watching them day and night, and we learned that from you. Uh, there was no ego shown there except compassion, empathy, and you listened to your colleagues. And uh, those things uh, not only 
I mean, th that's the important thing. When you see a giant in the field and we see you uh, caring about every comp complaint of the patient, uh, that receptivity is, is amazing and it's a pillar of caring. And the second pillar, which we've all been discussing, uh, is the responsibility. You have been a responsible doctor uh, to respond and transform these feelings of uh, empathy and, and caring about the patients who are suffering from complications and transforming these feelings into action, into uh, caring by now solving the big problems. And we all uh, wish you uh, continued success. I remember when you came to me 15 years ago, I was my last year as director, I didn't know it. And you came to me and you told me about a medical student who was doing well and you suggested that, you know, we're not going to live that long. So maybe we should be thinking about succession, your successor, that is. And you identified the medical student who ultimately we could recruit into residency in ophthalmology and cornea service, train with you for a few years. And maybe one day we'll continue your work. Uh, we've seen many of these come and go and you're still doing the work. So uh, I thought you were being a little bit... Uh, optimistic, but uh, I was, uh, I think, the pessimistic person. We'd like to have another session like this, class in 10 years and continue our congratulations and learn more from you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we really appreciate it. We love you so much. Thank, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a little story. I was on my way to Chicago to give a talk and um, and Dimitri was the chief there. And uh, uh, one of my French colleagues said, ah, Chicago, Al Capone. <laughs> and uh, I said, that's unfair. Al Capone has been dead for 80 years. It's time for new association. It should be Chicago, Dimitri Azar, <laughs> Nathalie Azar. And no, perhaps no. now is, is here and she sends her regards also and gratitude. Uh, Klaus and Natalie had the offices next to each other for 10 years. And uh, we, we all learned from you and we, we miss you and love you and wish you the best, Klaus. Well, thank you very much. And uh, talking about success, look at you here. Uh, that's uh, very heartwarming in itself so thank you very much thank you dimitri thank you so klaus I, before we move on with uh, eddie and uh, and jamari to close out the event i did want to give some time to dr guillermo amesqua he's been gathering some of the questions from the uh from the audience and then we like him to share any questions uh, before we move to the closing remarks from our from our bosses here from the meeting eddie and, uh, and jamari and guillermo please go ahead Thank you, Jose, and thank you, everyone that was involved in organizing this, Dr. Dolman. It's been incredible. Uh, first of all, there are many comments um, from your students uh, uh, wishing you the best, saying how much they love you. Um, Dr. Denise Freitas, Dr. Borja Salvador, um, Dr. Yushin Shui, Nat Dr. Natalia Abshari, Yan Shu Yu, all of them wishing you the best and, and uh, really enjoying this, um, this webinar. Uh, you've answered many of the questions. Uh, there's two questions uh, that I think will be good. Um, you know, you've been talking about being focused for decades. I, I mean, I, that that really stayed in my in my mind. And what what strategies do you recommend um, to stay focused for so long to prevent burnout uh, with the way things are going right now? Uh, uh, what do you recommend for young physicians to to achieve that? <clears throat> well, I guess it can be learned to a degree, but uh, I suspect that is to is in your DNA once and for all. So if you were born stubborn, you remain stubborn, and uh, that can sometimes serve you well, sometimes the opposite. But uh, uh, if you hear it often enough, that you should stay close to one line and try to build on top all the time rather than do a little here, a little there, uh, I think is, uh, is an important concept. It takes years to get into something new. 
just by the background to read about it. But if you if you build uh, vertically, uh, that's the way to do it. And eventually, you can possibly, if you're lucky, uh, get something that is uh, useful for part of mankind. Thank you. Jose, you tell me if there's a time or we should move forward. <laughs> you know, I just, before I do that, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, I have to make a comment about Ken's bib here. Ken, we want to get closer to the camera? Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, th this uh, was uh, originated uh, by me some uh, perhaps 40 years ago when uh, tank tops were still uh, uh, fashionable <laughs> and only to point out uh, that, uh, uh, KPRO research uh, is uh, funded uh, by uh, small contributions such as these. So uh, uh, coffee mugs, tote bags, and yes, uh, CHD <laughs> Cornea at Veritas t-shirts uh, are available through um, uh, the Mass Eye Inner Development uh, uh, Office. <laughs> what, do you, what do you charge for that? <laughs> <laughs> All goes to you, sir. <laughs> Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Otherwise, if Jemmery can't log in, we'll have an Eddie um, uh, close out the. Uh, oh, go ahead, Jemmery. I'm on. I'm on. On. When I was in Australia with Professor Kroc, Jerry Kroc, he used to go to Boston. To only see two people, Skeppens and Professor Dolman. So when, when I ended up in Miami, Jerry Clark told me, please, whenever you have a chance, go to Boston and go and visit with my friends. So I used to go in the 80s because they were developing vitrectomy machines up in Boston, and I had only two people that I really liked it at the time, and that was Skeppens and Professor Dorman. And I knew of the keratoprosthesis by Professor Croft. And I'm thanking Professor Dorman for seconding us in creating the KPRO study group. He was at the very first meeting, and I don't think he ever missed a single meeting. Thank you so much for all the things you did for us at Bascom Palmer, as well as at the University of Melbourne. Um, sadly, Jerry passed away, and otherwise he would be online with you. Thank you very much, Jean-Marie. It was very heartwarming. I like that very much. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Yes. Thank you, Jamari. Uh, so I guess we can uh, start uh, moving towards the end of our meeting. I'm going to have, of course, uh, the, uh, the chair of the meeting, Dr. Eddie Alfonso, make some final remarks. I do want it, of course, to, to, to also um, share my gratitude uh, of all the, uh, the mentorship, the uh, personal and professional mentorship that I've received from Klaus as uh, I can't say I'm at the senior level of all these great people that were here, but I certainly feel that uh, his encouragement throughout the, uh, my young career has been vital in uh, making perhaps small contributions to this field. And uh, I look forward to not only continuing it, but also sharing this, as, me as Dimitri mentioned, uh, these, this, this essence, this, uh, this mentorship to my children because uh, this goes beyond uh, our field. It's just a, 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 something that we like to share with, with uh, outside of our profession uh, to, to have the, this type of courage, this type of perseverance, uh, this type of humility, you know, being so humble and at the same time being so successful uh, and allow to continue this uh, great work uh, throughout all your fellows and people that you've touched. So that, for that, I thank you, Klaus. And uh, I, I, I leave now to Eddie to, to close it out for us. Thank you, thank Jose. Thank you very much, all of you. Yeah, thank you, Klaus, for uh, uh, allowing uh, yourself to take time off from your tennis game on a Saturday morning and uh, be here with us today. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. 
uh, reminds me of times when uh, we had uh, corneal transplants on Saturday morning and uh, if you didn't have a clinic, I know I could always call the club and find you on the tennis court and uh, <laughs> let you know that we had an emergency corneal transplant. But uh, it's, it's been wonderful for you to share with us. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for their uh, attendance and remarks uh, and certainly want to thank uh, Jean-Marie Perel for his uh, uh, in, in immense energy in keeping uh, the curative prosthesis study group uh, going and allowing many young uh, individuals to, to join and learn about uh, curative prosthesis. Uh, Jose, uh, without your enthusiasm, uh, this would not happen. You took it on to, to make it uh, happen. And um, I thank the University of Miami Baskin Palmer uh, IT team, uh, Alex uh, Gonzalez, and the rest of the team he put together to, to make this uh, program uh, uh, available to everyone. It's been recorded, so I'm sure that we will uh, put it up on the uh, Care to Prosthesis Study Group website so that uh, you can uh, share it with uh, friends who might have not been able to attend today. So have a great day, uh, uh, Klaus. Uh, keep on pushing us. We expect that. We wouldn't expect anything different from you because your uh, continued support and enthusiasm is extremely important to all of us. So. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great Eddie. weekend. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, could you, and thank could you, you stay, all. Yeah, can you stay on the screen a second? We want to do a screenshot. So everyone, uh, look straight at the camera. We want to do a screenshot. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for logging in. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Jose. Great job interviewing. <laughs> Amazing. Bye, yeah. everyone. Always fun Bye. to see you. Stay safe. See you in New Orleans. Bye. Bye. Hasta Bye. Thank Bye. you all.